sí vamos a apelar porque o se nos hace injusto que una niña de 14 años esté pagando por algo que no hizo. Tampoco había bullying. Había bullying de norma hacia los compañeros, no de mi hija hacia norma. Yo no voy a descansar hasta que la carpeta se haga pública porque ahí hay muchas cosas que no se tomaron en cuenta. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. So welcome to today's video. I thought today we could kind of like sit down and just talk about some updates that have come up in a handful of cases that I covered last year. I think doing these update videos are very important because these cases just cannot be forgotten. It's so important to know how the case is moving along, if the families are one step closer to getting justice, if the trial has happened yet, and if there's just anything that we can do to help. Today, we're going to be talking about four cases. The case of of Norma Lisbeth, the case of Maria Elena Gonzalez, the case of the University of Idaho students that were killed, and the case of Alexi Treviso. I really wish there were more updates on some of the cases that I covered last year, as well as some of the cases that I covered this year, but you know, most of them are still at the same spot that we left off on, so if there is ever any updates on any of the cases that I've covered, I can definitely do another one of these videos later in the year, or just update you guys in the community tab. Thank you guys again so much for being here, and for just being so amazing. Amazing. I know it sounds so cheesy you guys but I really do appreciate you guys so much like you have no idea how much you guys mean to me and I'm just truly grateful that we have this familia that is just so supportive so empathetic and that just wants to spread awareness on all of these very important cases if this is your first time watching one of my videos welcome bienvenidos hopefully you guys can hit the subscribe button and join the familia real quick before we get into today's video I want to thank our sponsors who support this channel and support the team that makes these videos possible did you guys ever have an imaginary friend growing up? You know, someone who you would tell your parents to make an extra meal for or buy an extra pair of socks, an extra lip gloss for, and your parents would just laugh and play along until you grew up and forgot all about your imaginary friend. But what if that imaginary friend never forgot about you and they were so angry that you had eventually abandoned them? I know I explore a lot of real world crime cases on this channel, but the upcoming movie Imaginary from the producer of Megan and Five Nights at Freddy's explores the dark side of our own imaginations and you guys have to check it out. An innocent stuffed bear named Chauncey turns out to be much more than one family could have ever imagined. On March 8th, he's not imaginary and he's not your friend. Make sure to check out Imaginary only in theaters on March 8th, rated PG-13. And now, let's get into today's video. Let's start off by talking about Norma Lisbeth. I will have her full video linked down below if you guys want more details about it, but I'll just quickly give you a brief summary for those of you who haven't seen that video or just don't really remember. Norma Lisbeth Ramos was a 14-year-old girl that lived in Teotihuacan, Mexico. She attended a school called Anexa La Normal that was in the San Juan area of Teotihuacan. Everyone says that Norma was a kind and generous daughter and just a really good friend. She used to always have a smile on her face and she used to always have a positive attitude and she used to be excited about life. However, that smile and positive attitude started to fade as Norma got older. She went from smiling and being happy and outgoing to being shy, timid, and quiet. So, why did this happen? Well, it's because Norma was being bullied at school. Every single day that Norma would attend school, she was taunted, she was verbally harassed, and she was just completely humiliated in front of everyone. One of her specific bullies was another girl named Asara Eileen. This girl would just not leave Norma alone. Like, oh my goodness, if you guys go watch my original video, you will understand how frustrating and how annoying this girl is. Like, she would bully Norma about the most horrendous things ever. It's just absolutely terrible. She would make the other students go up against Norma. She would discriminate against her because of her skin color. And she just did everything in her power to make Norma feel as left out as possible and to basically just make her time at school absolutely miserable. On February 20th, 2020, 23, Norma's bully, Asara, confronted her and told her that the next day on February 21st, she wanted to meet Norma outside of the school grounds and she wanted to physically fight her. So the next day on February 21st, 2023, the fight happened. Norma and Asara met outside of the school. I believe they were about like 50 feet outside of the school, so they weren't on school grounds, but they were definitely still nearby. The two girls were still wearing their school uniforms and they began to physically fight. The fight was horrible. I as I mentioned, you guys can watch the full video linked down below to hear more details. In the end, Norma ended up passing away due to the injuries that she received in this fight from Asara. Days after Norma passed away, her 
Takara Sada was still out and about just living her life as if nothing had happened. It wasn't until almost a month later on March 18th that Asada was finally arrested and charged with aggravated murder. However, since she was only a minor, you know, because she was only 14 years old at the time, she was sent to this facility called Quinta del Bosque Correctional Facility. Now, this center is a place where minors go to complete their sentences and it's a place where they try to, you know, rehabilitate them for when they're released. We ended the original video by saying that if Asada was found guilty for what happened to Norma, that she would only face five years in this facility, like not even in jail. Of course, people were really upset about this because they just felt like she deserved more time because of how brutal this attack was. And again, it wasn't even just like a fight, like someone died because of this. So all of this happened in February of 2023. And then on November 8th of 2023, there was a hearing that would determine what would happen next. You know, whether Asada would have a trial, whether she would stay in this institution for minors, if she was going to be charged as an adult, there was just a lot that was not known. The prosecutor's office of the state of Mexico said that this crime did qualify as a homicide, as aggravated assault against a woman, and as aggravated assault against a minor. So, the charges against Asada seemed intense. On October 31st, Asada was found guilty for the murder of Norma. Norma's mother, Francisca, spoke out and said that she felt so happy about this because, you know, what the prosecutors promised her became true. You know, they promised her that Norma would receive justice and that her killer would be found guilty and would be punished accordingly. Francisca just felt like a huge sigh of relief. She was like, yes, like my daughter's getting justice. This isn't going to get swept under the rug. Like this is great news. Asada's sentencing was scheduled to occur on November 8th. And while Norma's family was originally feeling so happy that Asada was found guilty, that happiness was short-lived because on November 8th, she was sentenced to only three years, which is absolutely shocking because at first people were thinking that she was only going to get five years at this facility for minors and people were upset thinking how she would only even serve five years because that's just insane. Now, apparently three years was a maximum that she could get and the reason why is because again, she is a minor and they really want her to just take these three years to reflect on what she did and to use these three years to become a better person, to grow and to like improve herself. That way when she is released and you know, she gets back into society, she can integrate herself into society as a new and you know, better person. Which I'm just like, hmm, I don't really know how I feel about that. I feel like that sounds pretty crazy because she brutally attacked someone. She laughed about it. She mocked this girl. She mocked the family. She did not have any type of remorse for what she did. So I just feel like they're giving her way too much leniency. Everyone just honestly felt like five years was going to be unfair. So to now hear that it's been decided that she's only going to do three years in this facility is absolutely unfair. You know, I get that she was only 14 years old, but the way that she was acting, I mean, she was acting like a grown woman, fighting, physically attacking people, being a bully. I feel like a lot of people, and you know, myself included, feel like is that she should feel grown enough to be tried as an adult and just serve a harsher punishment. Besides the three years that she was sanctioned, she also had to pay around 400,000 pesos to Norma's family, which didn't really make the family feel any better. Like, this wasn't about the money. This was more about actually receiving justice. Norma's sister, Alma, came out and said that this was just so unfair and that she was so dissatisfied with the sentencing. No fue gusto, porque tres años no vale la vida de mi hermana. Ella al final de cuenta va a salir, va a abrazar a su mamá. Y yo, ¿qué? Mi hermana, ¿en dónde está? La vi morir en mis brazos y eso nunca se me va a olvidar todo por ella. A mí me hubiera gustado que se quedara por el resto de su vida. Their mother also spoke out and said that she had asked the judge for a minimum sentence of at least five years. She was like, listen, if she's going to be charged as a minor, like, at least give me five years of justice. But to hear that this girl is only getting three years at this facility is horrible. Francisca said, quote, it's a short time because my daughter's life doesn't cost three years because that murder took my daughter's life and it's not fair. And I do feel it hurts because she took my daughter's life. La ley es muy justa. Fue tres años nada más. Tres años. Tres años nada más. Estoy inconforme. Sí, estoy. Es poco tiempo, sí, poco tiempo, la verdad, porque la vida de mi hija no cuesta tres años, porque esa asesina arrebató la vida de mi hija y no es justo, la verdad. Y a mí sí me duele porque, porque ella quitó la vida de mi hija para que digan que tres años, pues, 
Now, what really shocked me in this update is that Asada's mother, Magali, spoke out and said that this case has pretty much ruined Asada's life and her family's life. She said that it not only ruined and deprived her daughter of being able to go to high school with her friends and experience, you know, her teenage years, but that society has psychologically damaged her family, her friends, and her neighbors, since everyone thinks that she's like this crazy killer. She also added that her daughter was not the bully, but that instead, she was the victim of bullying. Bullying. Not only did she say that her daughter wasn't the school bully, but she also stated that Norma was not bullied and that Norma was actually the school bully. Yeah, she said that she started blaming the victim and making the victim seem like this horrible person, which is honestly crazy because a handful of other students have come forward stating that Asada was a bully. Like, it wasn't just Norma that experienced this. She did not only just mess with one person, she messed with other students in this class as well. Como muy, muy burlona y... Se, se sentía aquí en la, en la secundaria y así. Y pues, sí, le gustaba como burlarse de las demás niñas por su físico y todo eso. Pues se veía tranquila, pero si sí era, pues, este... Pues, ¿cómo le puedo decir? Era desmadrosa o algo así. A veces. Pues que sí, era prisionera a lo que llegué a escuchar yo. Ella era como la más agresiva... Y tenía muchos amigos que igual eran así. La mayoría de aquí son así. In this interview, Magali also added that she's not going to stop fighting until her daughter's sentencing is overturned and that it's not fair that a 14-year-old girl has to pay for something that she didn't do. Y sí vamos a apelar porque no se nos hace injusto que una niña de 14 años esté pagando por algo que no hizo. Lamentablemente hay muchas situaciones que al principio a todos los niños los intimidaron para que no se metieran. Tampoco había bullying. Había bullying de Norma hacia los compañeros, no de mi hija hacia Norma. Yo no voy a descansar hasta que la carpeta se haga pública, porque ahí hay muchas cosas que no se tomaron en cuenta. Esta pelea fue porque un día antes del 21 de febrero, Norma eh, retó a mi hija en las canchas de la primaria, de la primaria, perdón, de la secundaria. Entonces este, la agredió y quería que pelearan. Yo le dije, llegando mi hija me platica y yo le dije, ¿sabes qué hija? No caigas en provocaciones. No, no pelees, no tienes por qué pelear. Lo correcto es ir y decir solo a la maestra. Todos estamos conscientes que la única culpabilidad que ella tiene es haber aceptado la pelea. She said that this case has just made her daughter lose out on so many things, which is literally what her daughter did to Norma. You know, she literally took Norma's life away. She took everything away from her. You know, she took her future away, her life with her friends, with her family, her career. It's just so upsetting and just like very disturbing and like icky. Like, I hate using that word, but I'm like, that's how to describe this woman. Like, she's just so weird for not understanding that perspective and for only thinking about her daughter and not thinking, you know what? Yeah, Asada is going to be in this institution for three years. Yeah, she's not going to get to go to high school at the same time as her friends. But you know what? She should serve a punishment because she killed someone. She killed someone who now doesn't get the chance to ever do that. And I understand that she's a mom and that she loves her daughter and just can't accept that this happened. But I just feel like it's very insensitive to complain about how she won't get to go to high school for the next three years when again Norma is dead and will never experience anything ever again. Asada still has the opportunity to go to high school when her three years are up. You know she still has the opportunity to see her friends again, to get a boyfriend, to get married, to have kids. Norma doesn't have any of that so it just frustrates a lot of people how Asada's mom is still acting this way. I will link her interview down below. I'm not sure if it's going to get like copyrighted but my goodness like it's just so stressful hearing her talk. As of now, that's pretty much all the updates I have for you. I don't think we're going to be getting any more updates in a while because, I mean, Asada has been sentenced to three years, so I guess we will see what happens in three years when Asada is released. Even though a lot of people feel like she's probably going to get released way earlier than that just for having good behavior, this case is just so upsetting, you guys. Like, anytime I go back to this, I get so emotional because it breaks my heart that Norma was going through this type of bullying because of her skin color, because of her curly hair because of her family's like monetary status it's just horrible and the fact that everyone just watched this fight go down they recorded it they cheered asada on and then no one stepped in to defend norma or help her out is absolutely disturbing again i'm just so sorry that this happened to norma and that there really isn't justice for her again if there's ever any updates i will definitely let you guys know but as i said i think those will be the only updates for a while now let's take a break to hear from our sponsor imagine 
Imaginary in theaters March 8th. Lately, I have been really into horror movies, so when I found out that Blumhouse is coming out with a chilling new psychological horror movie this March, I had to find out all about it. Their upcoming release, Imaginary, taps into the innocence of imaginary friends and begs the question, what if your childhood imaginary friend was actually real? And he or she was so angry that you left them behind. Because I mean, how do you even explain to everyone else that your childhood imaginary friend is not imaginary at all and that it's mad that you've abandoned it? Mark your calendars for March 8th because Blumhouse and Lionsgate are bringing you back to your childhood imagination. And this time, you'll never leave. Never ever. Imaginary, only in theaters March 8th. Written by Jeff Wadlow, Greg Erb, Jason Ormland. Directed by Jeff Wadlow. Rated PG-13. And now, let's get back to the video. Okay, so now, let's talk about what happened to Maria Elena Gonzalez. Maria was an 11-year-old girl from Guatemala and she was born to her parents, Carmelo Gonzalez and Ana Elizabeth. Maria and her father lived at the main village apartments at 1004 Main Street, in Pasadena, Texas. The reason that they moved into these apartments is because Carmelo's brother and sister-in-law already lived there with their children. So he felt pretty safe, you know, living in this apartment building because his family was there and then they could kind of help him out with Maria. And because of that, he also felt comfortable enough leaving Maria home alone. On August 12, 2023, Carmelo woke up at 9 a.m. and started getting ready for work. As he was getting ready, he heard that there was someone in the hallway talking on the phone. This was a male voice, you know, someone that he didn't recognize, and he couldn't really hear what the person was saying on the phone, but it was loud enough for him to hear it all the way inside the apartment. Regardless, he continued getting ready for work, and then he ended up leaving the apartment at around 9.50 in the morning because he had to be at work by 10 a.m. Now, at this point, Maria is 11 years old, and she was left home alone while Carmelo went to work. Somewhere between 10.02 and 10.04 a.m., Carmelo received a message from Maria letting him know that someone was knocking on the door. He replies to Maria and tells her to not open the door and Maria says that she wouldn't. After that, Carmelo didn't hear from Maria ever again. He said that he kept calling and calling his daughter but she wouldn't answer the phone. Unfortunately, someone had broken into their apartment and murdered Maria. Carmelo ended up finding his daughter's body stuffed inside a laundry basket underneath their bed. It's just heartbreaking. I mean, that case was so brutal to talk about if you guys remember that video. It was was horrible. Like, I cried so much because, like, what the heck? Who does something like this? It's so unfair and so evil. In the end, police arrested 18-year-old Juan Carlos Garcia Rodriguez and charged him with capital murder in the death of Maria Gonzalez. Turns out that he lived in the same apartment complex as Maria and as for his defense, he claims that two African-American men made him do this. Yeah, it's disgusting that he said that. If you guys want to hear more about the case, again, it will all be linked down below. There hasn't really been that many updates in this case, but in December of last year, Juan was actually supposed to appear in court, but instead his lawyer, Jimmy Ortiz, appeared on his behalf. Jimmy asked the court if they could approve the expenditure of county funds so that they can hire a private investigator who will help them look for evidence and just kind of basically prove that Juan didn't do this. Now, Juan could not afford his own attorney, so Jimmy was appointed to him and it's kind of confusing like the setup that they have like where the money is coming from to like to pay for this private investigator like I didn't really understand what the attorney was asking from the court. Jimmy also did ask that if it was possible for him and for this new PI that they'll eventually hire to be able to visit Juan in jail either through like a FaceTime call on a computer or like an iPad or really just like on any type of device. So that makes me think that like Jimmy hasn't spoken to Juan about anything or like hasn't even spoken to him on the phone if he's literally asking them if he can at least talk to him and, and visit him in jail through like a FaceTime call. I don't know if the judge ended up approving this. I wasn't able to find a follow-up article on it. The judge is also still not budging on allowing Juan to receive bail, which I feel like is honestly a good thing because he's already ran away once before. So if he is released on bail, like I feel like personally he probably is going to try to run away again. Now, another statement that I read is that his lawyer is also looking to raise money so that they can pay to file the necessary paperwork to move the case forward. And at this point, Juan is still claiming that two African-American men forced him to do this. He is currently still in custody and there's even an order of detention out for him from immigration since he was here illegally. As of now, his next court hearing has not been set, but this case is just so heartbreaking and it just makes me so mad. Not only did he attack 
rape, assault, do all the stuff that he did to an 11 year old girl, but now he's putting the blame on two African American men. It's horrible. I don't even know where he got this idea from. Like, no one understands. Like, the prosecution is like, what is he even trying to say? Like, why would these two men force him to do this? Like, it just doesn't make any sense. I have no idea why he's trying to say this or how he's going to prove this or what this private investigator is going to find, if anything. So, yeah, I will definitely keep you guys posted on what happens with the private investigator and if there ever is a new court date set. A lot of people thought it was just really odd that he was trying to hire a PI, but at the same time, I'm sure he wants to do anything he can to prove that he is innocent. So, if he thinks that hiring this PI can help this case, I mean, I don't know what he's thinking because the evidence against him is pretty high. There still is not information either about when like a preliminary trial hearing is going to be held or anything like that. So it seems like this case is kind of moving a little bit slow, but yeah, what do you guys think about this? Okay, so now let's move over to Alexi Treviso. Alexi Treviso is a 19-year-old girl from the small town of Artesia, New Mexico. On January 26, 2023, Alexi went to a cheerleading practice and had a pretty normal day. She had a good practice, she spent time with her friends, and then she went home to get some rest. She went to bed but was woken up in the middle of the night when she started to feel some back pain, specifically in her lower back. The pain continued to get worse and worse. So at around 11.30 p.m., she approached her mom and told her about the pain that she was having, and that's when they decided to go to the emergency room. So Alexi and her mother get inside their car. They drive over to the Artesia General Hospital in the early morning hours of January 27th, and Alexi tells a front desk that she was having severe back pain. The doctors asked Alexi if she was pregnant, but she said no, that she was still a virgin and that she actually had her period. But that wasn't true because at around 1.30 in the morning, Alexi told the hospital staff that she really needed to go to the bathroom. She pretty much locked herself in the bathroom and when she finally came out about 20 minutes later, she just ran back to the hospital room without saying anything. Meanwhile, the housekeeper goes to clean the bathroom because Alexi actually left some blood behind and unfortunately, that is when the housekeeper had discovered that Alexi had given birth and thrown her baby's body in the trash can. It's crazy. This is just one of those things where I'm like, how is this? even real. If you guys again want to hear more about this, it will be linked down below. In the end, Alexi claimed that she never even knew that she was pregnant, but a lot of people doubt that. On May 10th of 2023, Alexi was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and with tampering with evidence. She was released on bail and is currently awaiting her trial. So let's talk about the updates. Towards the end of August, a judge ruled that while Alexi was on bail awaiting her trial, she could actually go to university. Yeah, she was allowed to go to New New Mexico State University to attend college classes in person, which honestly upset a lot of people, like understandably, because they just felt like she didn't deserve that. She killed a newborn and then tried to hide it, so it just doesn't seem right that she's allowed to go to college and just like live her life after doing something so horrible. As of now, Alexi has not entered any type of plea and her trial is set to start on August 26th, so it's definitely going to be a minute until we get to the trial and, you know, get to hear her perspective on this. However, she does have a pre-trial hearing on July 22nd, so maybe some more information will come out during that time. While she hasn't entered a plea yet, her lawyer says that he is going to fight to prove that she is innocent, so people assume that she's probably going to enter a not guilty plea. So yeah, we don't really know what she's going to plea yet or what her statement is going to be. What everyone is just like still so upset about is the fact that she was allowed to go to college. There was actually a petition created to prevent Alexi from attending university. It's actually reached quite a lot of signatures. As of now, when I'm filming the video, the petition is currently at 29,000 signatures. And I believe the goal is to get to 35,000 signatures. I'm not sure who started the petition, but this is a description for it. It says, quote, we concerned citizens of New Mexico call upon the authorities and educational institutions to take immediate action to prevent Alexi Treviso from pursuing a career in nursing or social work or any field of education. We believe that her recent actions, which include being charged with the murder of her newborn baby by throwing the infant into a trash can, demonstrate an alarming lack of empathy and disregard for human life. One of their main points in this petition is that the National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect conducted a study showing that there is evidence that suggests that individuals who commit acts of violence against children are more likely to exhibit that similar behavior later in life, which of course concerns people because Alexi wanted to work 
work as a nurse so she could potentially be around children in the future and it just scared a lot of people to think of her potentially getting into this career and maybe one day dealing with her own child so yeah i'm not really sure what will happen if this petition does reach 35,000 signatures i'm not even sure if the university will actually do something about this i don't even know if the university is even aware of the petition but yeah the fact that it almost has 30,000 signatures is insane and it just shows how many people just want this girl to actually be punished for what she did i will say though you know being a devil's advocate that there is a handful of people who do feel like alexi has the right to get an education because she technically is innocent until proven guilty one student said quote i don't agree with what she does but if she doesn't harm other people or is not threatening other people's safety then i'm okay with that i know they don't want her to be in here but it's not going to affect them i wasn't able to find any specific confirmation if alexi did end up going to university or if she was just gonna go next semester the semester was supposed to begin in august of 2023 but there was also another mini semester that began in october so i'm not sure what she ended up doing you know if she did go to classes in person or if she just continued her classes online i'm not really sure but yeah i don't know how i really feel about her going to university while she awaits for this trial to happen after literally killing her newborn i just feel like it's crazy that she could just like go on campus and just like be like a regular student while she's facing these like serious and big charges i don't know i would love to know what you guys think about this do you guys think that she does deserve to go to university or do you think that the petition is doing the right thing now in my original video i did mention how alexi's family was thinking of suing the hospital for negligence well it happened. Her lawyer, Gary Mitchell, filed a wrongful death lawsuit on behalf of Alexi's son, the one who died at the Artesia General Hospital. The details of the lawsuit are pretty long, so I will link an article down below, but the gist of it is that Gary is claiming that the hospital staff knew that Alexi was pregnant at least 40 minutes before she gave birth on the toilet. I was going through the lawsuit, you know, trying to read as much as I could, and it says that at around 12.51 a.m., doctors and nurses admitted that they received on their computers the notice of the results of the blood test showing that Alexi was pregnant. It then claims that Alexi was given medications such as Keteralac, morphine, and two other medications that all have warnings regarding use if the patient is pregnant. So her lawyers are like, well, they already knew that she was pregnant at this point, yet they still kept giving her this medication. The lawsuit also states that then at 1.39 in the morning, they claim that Alexi said that she needed to go to the bathroom, that she went down the hallway, and and then, well, we know what happened next. They're also claiming that the hospital staff was negligent in releasing the videos of Alexi in the hospital, and in the end, they're stating that the employees and the doctors were aware of the pregnancy at 12.51 a.m., yet they let her go to the bathroom alone at 1.39 in the morning. They also failed to inform Alexi that she was pregnant, and they also failed to take the necessary healthcare procedures and protocols for a pregnant woman who was at term. So yeah, the lawsuit is definitely interesting. We will see what happens with that, but as I mentioned, her trial won't start until this August. From here until then, you know, new information might come out. And of course, during the trial, a lot of new information is going to come out. So I will definitely keep you guys posted on what happens. I still just think that this case is just absolutely horrible. And I just, I wonder what's going to happen in the trial. But definitely let me know what you guys think. Lastly, let's talk about the new updates and the murders of the University of Idaho students. This case, you guys, just like, oh my god, it always always affects me when I talk about it. It's actually very scary. Like I remember when I first was doing the research for this case last year, I was genuinely like scared. Like I was like, oh my god, this is just so scary. Like someone doing this in the middle of the night to these like young college kids. It's just absolutely frightening. The full video will be linked down below, but this is a brief summary of what happened. On November 12th, 2022, someone broke into a house on King Road in Moscow, Idaho and brutally killed Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal and Ethan Chapin. Kaylee, Madison, and Zana were roommates. While well, at the time, Kaylee had already moved out, but she was visiting her friends. And then Ethan was Zana's boyfriend who was just spending the night after a party. There were also two other roommates in the house that night who I will refer to as DM and BF. However, they survived. DM says that she saw a man who is believed to be the killer leaving the house. He walked right past her, but he didn't see her, which is honestly such a miracle. A few weeks after the murder, 
murders on December 30th, 2022, 28-year-old Brian Koberger was arrested and charged for the murders of Madison, Kaylee, Zaina, and Ethan Chapin. There is currently a gag order in place, so there's not a lot of details being released right now. The trial was actually supposed to begin in October of 2023. The victims' families were getting ready for this. You know, they knew that this was going to be a very emotional and just very difficult journey. However, they just really wanted to get justice as soon as possible for their children. That way, everybody could just like kind of start to move on from this, you know? Like the longer this like drags out, the harder it is, I feel, for the families to just keep dealing with this because, you know, all they want is closure. So the families were getting ready to, you know, take this emotional journey. However, Brian ended up waiving his right to a speedy trial. So as of now, the trial date is unknown. In February of this year, Brian and his team appeared in court to see if a trial date would finally be set. However, the judge didn't make a decision. They said, quote, I'm listening carefully to both sides and it's a complicated case. It's a death penalty case. As of now, the judge set a new hearing to take place on May 14th so that they can address a motion for the change in venue and then once it's determined if the trial will be moved to a new venue, then the trial date can finally be set. Honestly, it just sounds like such a long journey and I just feel so bad for the families who have to keep waiting and waiting. In fact, Brian's defense team actually wants to keep pushing the trial back and they even asked if the trial could wait to begin until at least 2025, which, you know, wow is definitely just so stressful especially for Kaylee's family who's just very vocal about this. Kaylee's dad is just like enough like let's stop pushing this like let's just get this done with let's get the justice let's get this closure and like just stop elongating it. Now the reason that they're trying to do a change in venue is because Brian's defense attorneys feel like he won't get a fair trial because of how public this case is and how there's so many articles written about it and there's already so many documentaries and I'm sure a movie is probably being made about it. So his lawyer lawyers are like, you know, this is just so publicized. So I feel like the jury might know too much and it's just not going to be a fair trial. So they just want to move it to a different location. I don't know if that will end up happening. We will see what happens on May 14th. In regards to them wanting to push the trial until 2025, the prosecution, of course, pushed back on this and stated that Brian's defense has had plenty of time to review all of the evidence in this case and that it just can't continue to be delayed. Now, there was also a debate whether or not cameras should be allowed in the courtroom once his trial begins. I believe Kaylee's family did want cameras in the courtroom. I'm not really sure about the other families just because Kaylee's family has been very public about their opinions and you know about what is happening in the case. So they really wanted cameras during the trial because they just want people to know the truth. In the end, the judge banned members of the media and the public from using cameras slash audio recording devices in the courtroom because they believe that it could jeopardize Brian's right to a fair trial. This Despite the media not being allowed to bring cameras, the court itself will live stream the trial, which will be available to watch on YouTube. So yeah, like the public will be able to watch the trial as it happens. I'm just assuming that they didn't want like the media to record it themselves just in case something needed to be cut out. So we will see what happens with the trial. Some people feel like it probably will begin in October of this year. Some people feel like it might actually continue to get delayed and that it'll take years for this trial to finally begin. Which again, as I've mentioned, is just so frustrating for the families, especially because they had already prepared for the trial to begin a few months ago. So to know that they might have to wait years to get justice is very upsetting. As for the house where Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan were killed, the last update that I gave you guys was that the status of the house was in question. There were plans to demolish the house, but some people wanted to preserve it, you know, just in case the jury needed to do a walkthrough during the trial or, you know, just in case the house would be needed for something else. So some Some people really wanted to preserve it, but others really just wanted to demolish it and just kind of get the house over with because they just felt like this house was a constant reminder of the terrible crime that happened there. In the end, the university decided to demolish the house on December 28th of last year. The university hoped that removing the house would reduce the impact the deaths have on the many students who live nearby. Scott Green, the president of the university, said, quote, It is a grim reminder of the heinous act that took place there. 
there. While we appreciate the emotional connection some family members of the victims may have to this house, it is time for its removal and to allow the collective healing of our community to continue. It's very frightening, so I understand why the university and the community wanted to demolish the house, but I also understand the family's perspective. As I mentioned, Kaylee's family really did not want the house to be demolished, so when they heard the news about this, the family's attorney came out with this statement. I'll only read a little part of it because it's pretty long, but I'll put the rest of the statement here on the screen. It said, quote, Let us ask this. Isn't it better to have the King Road house and not need it than need the house and not have it? This has been our question to the prosecution and the University of Idaho for the entire time the demo of the King Road has been an issue. But why is it even up for discussion? This is one of the most horrific crimes in the history of Idaho and the University of Idaho wants to destroy one of the most critical pieces of evidence in the case. And it is also important to make note that there is now a demolition date before there is even a trial date set. This alone speaks volumes. The attorney also added that maybe the prosecution or the defense would need to go back to the house, you know, to the scene of the crime to gather more evidence. So he just feels like it's like a waste of money and resources to demolish this house before the trial has even began. He also added that the victim's families have a voice and that they should be heard and listened to. Just the night before the demolition took place, Kaylee's family and Zana's family pleaded with the university and with the local prosecutors to please not tear down the house. Kaylee's dad also spoke out on Facebook when he heard the news and said, quote, Today was especially hard because we were notified that they plan on tearing down the house on December 28th, just three days after Christmas. Here is the thing with the house. I get it. It's an eyesore. It makes the community in college sad. It's a house of horrors. So on and so forth. Yes, Kaylee unfortunately died in that house, but more importantly, Kaylee lived a fun, happy life in that house. So, my point is, when the house is tore down, it will be a very sad day for me. Salt in a wound that never heals. I swear that statement just made me feel so sad. It's just such a hard decision to make because, because as I said, I completely understand both sides. There was actually a petition made to stop the demolition and Zana's mom actually shared this petition and wrote, quote, My daughter was murdered in that house and there is no way that they should be destroying any evidence. As I said, it definitely is such a difficult decision to make because, I mean, yeah, what if the jury does need to do a walkthrough or what if the prosecution needs to go back to just like confirm information? So it's just really hard to know whether or not the house will be necessary when the trial begins. I would definitely love to know what you guys think about this. The university says that they are going to create a memorial garden on the property to honor Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan. So we will see what happens with that. As for what's happening with the alleged killer, Brian, his defense team has tried to get the charges against him dropped, I believe like two times already. And in one of these attempts, his lawyers argued that the prosecution was withholding evidence that might help Brian in defending himself and that they were presenting evidence that biased the jury. However, a judge denied both of these attempts, so his charges have not been dropped and I honestly don't think they ever will. I'm sure his lawyers are going to keep trying to do that and just keep trying to do anything to prove that he is innocent, but I don't know, the evidence against him is honestly just shocking. It's pretty big and this trial is just going to be so massive. I believe they said that they were expecting the trial to last, oh my god, I forget if they said like two to four weeks or if they said four to six weeks. However, other people have said that the trial is probably going to last much longer because there's just so much evidence, witness statements, and just so much information to go through. So that trial is definitely going to be very intense. This is honestly just such a confusing case. I mean, what was the reason for this? You know, that's everyone's like main question is like, why did he do this? Did he know the victims? Was he stalking one of them? Was he scouting the house for weeks, you know, even months before the crime occurred? Why did he have to do this? There's honestly just so many unanswered questions. I really just hate that this happened, you guys. Like, like I said, this case just really impacted me a lot because these were just four young college students with their entire lives ahead of them. And it was just taken from them in such a brutal and horrific way. My thoughts and prayers go out to the families. And again, I just truly hope that they do receive justice. But all right, you guys, with that, that is pretty much all the updates I have for these four cases. I wish that more of the cases that I covered had more updates. I wish that the unsolved cases that I covered were solved, but unfortunately that's not the case right now. Hopefully in the future we will have more updates to share with you guys, but I really appreciate you guys so much for taking the time to listen to these updates and for helping me spread awareness. Like I said at the beginning, you guys are literally the best familia ever 
and it's actually crazy how much we continue to grow every single day. Like we're at 230,000 members. Like what? That's actually crazy. Like I remember when we hit 100k as if it was just yesterday. So yeah, thank you guys so so much for being here. Before we end today's video, I want to give a final shout out to Imaginary hitting theaters March 8th. I just can't get this film out of my mind, you guys. You know, I'm all for true crime and real life events, but sometimes the depths of our imagination provide the most chilling scenarios. And blurring that line between fiction and reality is where it really gets good. Imaginary is a brand new horror flick that taps into the innocence of imaginary friends and asks the question, what if your childhood imaginary friend was actually real and he or she was so angry that you left them behind? I don't know about you, but these are the things that I try not to think about late at night. From the producer of Megan, Five Nights at Freddy's, The Black Phone, and The Invisible Man, and the director of Truth or Dare comes Imaginary. Come explore the darker side of your imagination and get ready to rethink everything. Imaginary, only in theaters March 8th, rated PG-13. Thank you again to Imaginary for sponsoring this video and supporting this channel. All right, you guys, make sure to let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. Also, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up because it really helps the channel and I would really appreciate it if you guys could do that. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. I will see you all in the next video. Bye guys.